In this video, we're going to go over four of the most super common cognitive distortions that people with BPD have to face, and we're going to go over what they are, why we use them, how can you notice them in your day-to-day -day life, and then how do you stop engaging in those cognitive distortions so you can find more mental freedom and clarity. So let's go ahead and dive right into the very first one, the super common one that everyone with BPD knows about, black and white thinking or splitting. So splitting, as everyone knows with BPD, is basically using kind of extremes in order to categorize the world. This will show up in relationships most often, right? You'll have someone who you'll meet they'll become your favorite person you'll think they're perfect they're awesome they're the best person in the world and then they'll do one thing wrong and all of a sudden now you think they're the most evil horrible person who has ever lived splitting is essentially just using extremes in order to simplify the world and make it easier for our mind to navigate when we use these extremes it becomes a lot easier for our mind to process information because with bpd we have really intense emotions and to explain these intense emotions we have to resort to extremes right because when you find someone who becomes your favorite person you've only known them for a little bit it feels like there's a weird kind of cognitive dissonance where you feel these intense overwhelming feelings for this person even though you've just met them so in order to justify those intense overwhelming feelings you need to feel like they're perfect they're awesome they're the best because that's the only way you could like someone this much this quickly and then when they do inevitably do something that messes up that perfect image in your head you come crashing down because you had all of these hopes and expectations built up because of your high emotions and because of the wording that you use in splitting so now that we understand what it is and why we use it how do we combat it so the first First step is to become aware of it. So how do you become aware of it? You need to notice when you're using words that are extremes. So words like never, always, perfect, best, worst, hate, love, etc, etc. Watch out for very intense, extreme language that implies that something is always a certain way, something is never a certain way. Splitting is not just limited to people, you know, it can happen to things like jobs as well. When you first hop into a job, you think it's the best job in the world, you think it's awesome, then you have an inconvenience and now you think it's the worst job ever and you need to quit and find a new one, right? Splitting keeps a lot of people stuck and it's kind of at the core of a lot of the other cognitive distortions we're going to cover as well. So that that's basically kind of the first step is notice when you're using these words, right? And then the second step is to find a middle ground. Dialectical behavioral therapy, which is a gold standard treatment for BPD, is all about this. You wanna try and find middle grounds whenever you can. So whenever you find yourself saying something is always gonna be horrible, remember always is an extreme, right? We're on one end of the spectrum. So when you find yourself thinking like, you know, someone is always gonna be perfect, they're the best in the world, whatever. Think about the opposite first. Think about, okay, if I switched all the words in the sentence, what would it be? Someone is the worst person in the world. They're never gonna be there, et cetera, et cetera. And then find something kind of in between, right? So instead of saying this person is the best, the most perfect person I've met in my life, you can make this a little bit more neutral and make it, this person is someone who I really enjoy spending time with and I haven't met someone who I connect this closely with in quite a bit of time. You can see how this statement is a lot less intense. And then again, it's easier for you to not split on this person and go from thinking they're the best to thinking that they're the worst because you have a much more reasonable idea of who they are. If you think someone's the best or perfect, if they mess up, then yeah, it's gonna be devastating. But if you find someone who's just, you know, better than a lot of the people you've met in recent memory, then it's not as big of a deal if they slip up or do something, you know, imperfect because you don't think they're perfect. You just think they're a cool person and you're grateful to have them in your life. Now, the next cognitive distortion is catastrophizing. So first, again, let's understand what it is is and why do we use it? So catastrophizing is the tendency to jump to the worst possible case scenario whenever we're confronted with anything somewhat challenging. So the common examples in BPD can be things like, you know, your partner doesn't respond to a text for two hours when they usually respond within one hour. So then you catastrophize and immediately assume they're gonna leave me, right? You immediately kind of will jump to the kind of worst case outcome that you're really terrified of. This can also show up really often at work, right? Maybe your boss gives you a bit of criticism, you know, they'll be like, hey, this thing that you did was a little off, just you know, make sure you work on that next time and you'll be like, oh, okay, they criticize me, so I'm gonna lose my job. So why do we use it? So catastrophizing is somewhat of a protective mechanism. So in the past, maybe we weren't, you know, careful enough at predicting bad scenarios in the future. So like maybe we were at a job and we were a little bit careless and when our manager criticized us, we didn't take it seriously and then we ended up getting fired, right? Or maybe in a relationship, we didn't notice when someone was leaving us or abandoning us. Maybe it was when we were children and, you know, we had some kind of abandonment happen when we were kids, maybe with a parent, maybe with a friend, something like that, and we weren't careful enough or we couldn't do anything to kind of control the outcome of that other person.
person leaving. Before we were potentially under sensitive or we weren't you know, able to do anything to prevent separation or abandonment. So as an adult, we become oversensitive to abandonment, right? We become oversensitive to specific things and triggers within our environment. Maybe we become oversensitive to criticism at work because one time we were undersensitive. And because we've swung kind of the other way, now what we'll do is we'll try and like overly protect ourselves so that we never have to feel that pain again of maybe of losing a job, maybe of losing someone close in our life, something like that. So that's how it can be a protective mechanism. You know, your body's trying to protect you from having like a similarly painful experience as you had in the past, because usually there's a very painful experience associated with these worst case kind of fears when you immediately jump to assume that something's gonna be terrible or something like that. The other big thing can actually be to spur you into action. With ADHD, this is super common. Like if you have a really hard time motivating yourself and getting yourself to do stuff, you know, if your boss gives you a criticism and you have ADHD, you might not feel that much motivation if it's not a big deal. So in order to motivate yourself to do simple things, everything has to become a catastrophe or like the worst case scenario. It can't be like, I might not do as well at my job. It has to be like, oh, I will get fired from my job. And that urgency that like, oh no, I need to fix this right now. That can motivate people who struggle to motivate themselves to act. So this can also show up in depression and stuff like that. And this is also like how anxiety can also kind of be used to almost like overcome or compensate for ADHD sometimes. So catastrophizing is really hard to notice sometimes in the moment. Um, so the big thing you have to remember is, you know, notice kind of your common patterns first. So you'll notice that there are some things you catastrophize over a lot more than others. So for some people, their health might be what they catastrophize about, right? They become overly concerned that like they're going to catch some very bad illness. The second they get a cough, they jump to, I have lung cancer. You might notice in relationships, if you have BPD, this is really common. You'll tend to catastrophize in relationships. You will immediately jump to the worst case that this person is going to leave me. So first notice where you catastrophize. And this can help you, you know, whenever you get that maybe that abandonment fear you'll be like okay i might be catastrophizing right now so let me just kind of lean back and check the facts another thing to check too is like how many logical leaps are you making so oftentimes you won't immediately jump to the worst case scenario but we'll be like okay this person isn't responding back to my text why aren't they responding back? Oh, they must be busy. Well, what are they busy doing? They're probably busy being with someone else. Oh no, they're with someone else because they wanna leave me and they don't wanna be with me anymore. That's why they're not responding. Like we kind of have this chain of events, right? So like, look at your thinking and kind of ask yourself, how did I arrive at this conclusion? And if there are multiple steps you have to take to get there that like you cannot definitively prove, like there's no definitive proof that XYZ thing is gonna happen, you are likely catastrophizing. So again, in that example I gave, there were several logical leaps I had to make in order to be like, okay, this person is leaving me. So the first thing I can notice is an objective fact. This person isn't responding to me as quickly as I can. But then I make the logical leap to be like, oh, they're not responding to me because they're with someone else. Or maybe I'm like, they're not responding to me because they don't want to talk to me and they're sick of me. That's a logical leap. And then you make another logical leap to assume that maybe they're out doing something with someone else because they don't want to be with you or you assume that they're going to leave you, right? If you cannot definitively prove like, okay, this is what's going on, then yeah, you are catastrophizing. There needs to be definitive proof and if you don't have that and you're making assumptions about the worst case scenario happening, you're catastrophizing. And then the second thing to do is like kind of take your extreme catastrophizing and neutralize it a little bit. Instead of being like, this person is gonna leave me, bring it back to this person may be upset at me and I'm not sure why, but most likely they're not. This is like very true, right? That's something you can like definitively say could be a true statement, right? This person might be upset at me, but there's a pretty low chance given the evidence that's going on, right? So use the facts to inform your statement, right? Look at the evidence and what's actually going on and then use this to inform what you're actually kind of thinking or saying and remember avoid those extremes now let's move into the third cognitive distortion which is emotional reasoning now this is something that is extremely common for people with bpd because of how intensely emotional we are so basically the way that emotional reasoning works is if i feel a certain way then that is true so i can explain this through an example a little bit easier if you feel hopeless right you're in a depressive episode and you feel like you're worthless and that nothing is going right in your life you are worthless and nothing is going right in your life. If you feel like your partner is gonna leave you, then your partner probably is gonna leave you. That's kind of what emotional reasoning is, right? If you feel like something is gonna happen, then it is gonna happen. So why do we use emotional reasoning? The thing is emotional reasoning is actually pretty common and pretty useful. Emotional reasoning is used very often in our day-to-day -day lives. We need emotions in order to reason and understand things, right? So like, for example, if we were like out in the wild and we were getting attacked by something or like something was there and we couldn't logically see it or understand it, but we felt something was off, right? 
Those kinds of feelings of anxiety, of danger, of gut feelings are super important and can be super useful because sometimes our subconscious, you know, our emotions will pick up on things quicker than our logical mind. You know, sometimes there's nothing logically wrong, but we can feel that there's something wrong. So this isn't always a completely bad thing, right? This is actually pretty useful. But the thing is, emotional reasoning becomes a problem when our emotions, like we know with our BPD, will go very intense very quickly and we can't really control them. That's one big part of it. And then another big part of it is our emotions will be very unhelpful, right? Like they're kind of pushing us in a direction we don't want to go. They're communicating things to us that are not effective, et cetera, et cetera. Like splitting is a good example. You know, when we get super angry at our partner over really small infractions and then this causes damage in our relationships. So how do we notice it? Um, one of the biggest things is when you feel a certain way, notice the objective facts that actually support how you're feeling. So if you feel like you're worthless and that everything is going wrong, you know, try and think of like, is truly everything going wrong? Everything is a very, again, extreme statement. And you can actually list out, okay, what are the actual things that are going wrong that are making me feel upset? And what are things that aren't going wrong? And you know, if you say there's everything is going wrong, there's nothing going wrong, you're talking, you're breathing, you're still alive, you still have like the ability to do things, right? When you have this kind of stuff, this this means that like there's something going right. There's a good John Kabat Zinn kind of quote. I don't remember exactly how it goes, but it goes something like if you're breathing, then there's more right with you than there is wrong with you. And so you can always keep that in mind. You know, if you have a house, if you have any kind of income coming in, if you're able to do anything, like there's always something going right right? So you can find evidence that contradicts how you feel. And that'll kind of help you not get stuck in that, like, I feel a certain way, so it must be true and move more towards I'm feeling a certain way, but it might, might not necessarily align with reality. This might just be a feeling I have. Another big thing is notice your emotional intensity. If your emotional intensity is above a seven, eight or nine, and if you have BPD, it's very rare that this emotional intensity is actually matching to the situation, right? Because with BPD, we access high, high intense emotions very quickly, even if the situation doesn't call for them. So we either are at 100 or at zero, right? So if we're at 100, we need to realize that like this is not necessarily matching the situation and you want to wait for that emotional intensity to go down before you can really, you know, rationalize if the emotion was correct or not. First thing we want to detach from our emotions. When we are in an intense emotional state, we want to try and detach from our emotions as much as possible. We want to just notice how we feel, notice the emotions in our body and not act on them immediately, right? This is the other big part. So first, be mindful of your emotions, let them be there, and recognize that sometimes you can just feel things that aren't necessarily true. And just recognize your feelings are not facts. So just feel whatever it is that you're feeling, let yourself feel it. You may be grieving some past trauma, something might have happened, you may just be tired, who knows? Let yourself feel those things, and then don't act on anything until the emotion has settled down. Once the emotion has settled down, you'll have a much better idea of what is actually true and what is actually bothering you, stuff like that. A good rule of thumb can be avoid making big decisions until your emotional intensity is below a five out of 10. Now, the final cognitive distortion that we'll be diving into is mind reading. Mind reading is when we assume that we know what others are thinking based on their actions. So this is oftentimes found in phrases like, oh, I just know she feels that way, or I just know he means that when he said this or something like that. So why do we use this? The thing is with mind reading, we're often very overconfident in how well we can read people. A lot of people who think they're just really good at reading people, that isn't true. No one is actually that good at reading people. Even people who are like, you know, their living is to be able to read people like therapists and stuff like that. People are not that accurate at reading people, right? And the thing is, we think we're more accurate than we actually are because we never get any feedback or confirmation on if we're actually reading people correctly. Nine out of 10 times when we read someone, that person doesn't actually confirm if we're correct or not, right? We just think we're right and we go about with our day. So there's a lot of cognitive bias that comes into play. And the other big reason that we use it is oftentimes we're just afraid to ask people how they are and ask for our needs to be met. Oftentimes, whenever we're mind reading, the thing is like someone is doing something that is upsetting us and we're just reading their mind and we're assuming their attentions behind it are malicious so that we don't have to like go and ask them for our needs or it's like, you know, tell them how we're feeling. So a good example can be like if our partner is being a little bit more distant or something like that, a lot of people would be PD like, oh, he just hates me. That's why he's not texting me back. Or she just doesn't care about me. That's why she isn't texting me back. Something like that. We're reading their minds. We're assuming the intentions behind their behavior. And the reason for it again is because we're scared to just be like, hey, I need more attention. Hey, can you give me a little bit more in this relationship? I feel a little bit lonely right now. That communication is really scary because it's super vulnerable, right? That's why we don't want to do it. And that's why we use mind reading. So how do we notice it? Notice when you are assuming what someone's intentions are, what they're feeling, what they're thinking, everything like that. Notice when you're assuming those kinds of things and notice what 
actual evidence you have, right? If you're gonna say something like them not texting me back means that they don't care, that's wrong. And that's stupid. I'm gonna be frank, that's stupid. That's not at all true because there are several hundred other reasons, easily a hundred other reasons why someone could not be texting you back that don't have to do with you at all. So first identify that. Is there any concrete proof? Like did this person say something to you? Did they tell someone else that they hate you and that they don't wanna talk to you? Do you have definitive proof of that person saying this thing, right? And if the answer is no, if you were to go to a court of law and to try and prove that someone is upset at you, could you actually find concrete evidence that shows that they're upset at you? And if the answer is no, then they are probably not upset at you. And you have to notice when you're assuming that you know someone's behavior, even though you have no concrete evidence to prove it. So how do we combat this? You need to actually talk to the person, communicate to this other person, right? You have to ask them, hey, how do you feel? Tell them how you're interpreting their behavior and say, you know, I might be wrong, but, but today you didn't text me back and, you know, as quickly as you usually do. So I assumed that you were upset at me and I wanted to make sure that's not actually what's going on. So when you say these kinds of things, right, when you actually openly communicate how it is you're feeling, it's really scary, it's really uncomfortable, but that's the only way you're gonna combat this because the thing is you cannot read minds. So that's the end of the video. Hope this video helps. Thank you for watching and take care.